Um, hello, and thanks, thanks all for, for coming. Um, I guess the, I'll start with an outline of what I'm going to tell you. I'm, I'm going to, I guess, tell you what Cython is and what the limited API is, so you, I guess we're all on the same page. I'm going to give you a bit of a background of, I guess, how we ended up at the position we are now, and I'll tell you what are the benefits of using Cython with the limited API, but also what are the sort of limitations and what's the performance. Then, I guess there's about three or four slides of actually useful information that you can practically use about how you use it. Um, that, and then at the end, I've kind of just got an unlimited amount of obscure technical details. And this is the stuff that interests me, but doesn't interest, I guess, the rest of you, because you guys don't come to a Python conference to hear about sort of C and low-level C code. So I'll, I'll cover as much of that as I can and you know, try to leave time for questions. But we may not get through all the technical details. Um, so the first thing is, what is Cython? Um, and I, I guess we start with, it's a sort of open source project, um, and it's one that I've been involved with for about sort of five years now. So I'm, I'm talking in that capacity. Um, it generates C code, and that can be compiled into an extension module. So you write Python-like code, so it should all feel very familiar with you, and you end up with fairly optimized C code. And there's, there's a whole list of use cases. Um, you can use it to wrap a sort of external C or C++ library, so as a language binding. Um, you can speed up your, your Python code either just by compiling it or by, by adding um, static typing, so, so specifying the types of things to either be a fixed Python type or a fixed C type. And you can, you can really speed up um, operations on things that have the, the buffer protocol, so NumPy arrays are a classic example. You can iterate across them very, very quickly, um, and that lets you do things like loops over arrays, which are, are really quite slow in pure Python. And so the, the little sort of line drawing up there is, is what I consider the sort of the main nice feature about it, that your sort of normal language binding, the, the interpreter and the sort of the non-interpreter layer are kind of fixed, whereas in, in Cython you can have the interpreter and sort of the compiled, non-compiled layer actually quite high level um, above, above your sort of Python-like code and your C-like code. So you can, you can write quick Python-like code. Um, and even if you don't use it yourself, um, it's used in a lot of low-level numeric libraries, so it, you use it accidentally, most likely. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's kind of important in the ecosystem, even if, even if you, you choose not to use it yourself. Um, so what is, what is the limited API is the sort of next question. Um, and the limited API is, is for writing extension modules. Um, so this is compiled, compiled modules that, that interact with Python and you can call from Python. Um, and so in this, in this context, I'm talking about you're not using the limited API, Cython's using the limited API, and you're getting the benefits of it. Um, and I've drawn this kind of blobby diagram here that the Python has a sort of fairly extended C API. So the limited API is this little, little red circle sort of at the bottom left, which contains a few functions. Um, and then you've got the public API, which is, is quite, you know, quite large, quite extensive, maybe, you know, some of it sort of historical. Um, you've got a sort of new feature, the Py Unstable API, which is, is sat just on the edge of the public API, that it is documented, but they, they warn you they're going to change it you know, at a rapid pace. And you've got the, the um, underscore Py API, so it's anything that starts with an underscore, the um, Python core developers get slightly upset when you use, but all the good stuff's hidden there. Um, so you know, so there's, there's, a, there's a kind of trade-off. Um, and um, I, guess, I guess it then relates to the stable ABI. So ABI isn't something that, as a, as a um, Python developer, you usually have to think about. But the, the, AB, the API, API, so P is, I think, programming, is kind of the text you write. So in this case, the C code you write is what defines the API, whereas the ABI is the interaction with the compiled program. So um, the way I like to think about it is the limited API is kind of a restriction. So you're saying you have to only use this small set of functions and, and ignore all the good stuff. Um, but the benefit you get is from the stable ABI. And what the stable ABI says is that your extension modules will keep working into the future without recompilation. So you can, you can compile an extension module on like Python 3.7 and it will keep working on 3.15 and that's kind of the promise behind it. 
Um, so it kind of can only be expanded, whereas the limited API can be evolved and deprecated slowly. Um, I don't think a lot's been removed from it, but the, the sort of the binary side of it will, will stay. Um, and so the, from the limited API point of view, your source code is likely to continue working into the future, but it's not absolutely guaranteed. Um, historically, it was introduced in PEP 3.384. Um, that's, yeah, I think it made it into Python 3.2. I guess in my, my personal opinion, it became usable about Python 3.7, but um, yeah, this is, that's, that's opinionated. You, you, can, you can agree or disagree. Um, so I guess the history of the limited, the limited API in Siphon. The first commit, which I, I only found out about when I kind of actually started preparing this talk, was, was back in um, 2012 um, by Bradley um, Froehler. And I'm going to mispronounce a few people's names in this section. So if, if, you ever end, if these people ever end up watching it, I apologize. Um, and he, he was just interested in sort of one very small feature. So he'd got a small handwritten module, and he wanted it to be limited API compatible. Um, so it didn't, it didn't cover a lot. But that was the first commit that kind of referenced it back in, in 2012. So you can tell I'm giving you the latest up-to-date information here. Um, the, the first real work um, was done in 2019, um, mostly by Eddie Elizondo at um, Facebook or, or Meta. And that, that's the kind of large commit, 700 lines or so. And that, that provides a lot of the sort of infrastructure that, that, we, that we use. Um, it also adds static module state, which is, a, is tangential to this talk, but is another kind of ongoing project to complete. Um, so they, they contributed um, a bunch of stuff from their internal, internal work. I don't think they've contributed all of it, probably just due to, I guess, inertia and lack of time. But um, this did a good chunk of the preparatory work, but um, it wasn't actually in a position where you could compile against the limited API. And they, that, that is basically what made it into the Cython 3.0 release. Um, so we released Cython 3.0 in um, July last year, so about a year ago. Um, and I guess sooner or later, people tried to use this limited API work and found it didn't work and predictably kind of complained about it, um, which, I mean, we kind of knew it didn't work. And, but, but it, yeah. So, so in August that year, um, I, I did a sort of bit more work. So I fixed it so there was one minimal module that worked. You could compile one thing, this Fibonacci program would work in the limited API. Nothing else but you know, this, this one thing. Um, and so, yeah, we've got, we, I added this, this one test, which um, is now part, you know, is part of our test suite, has been expanded a bit and kind of enforces that it does actually, does actually now work. Um, and I guess the situation today, um, so almost all of the improvements are going into the upcoming Cython 3.1 release. Um, so if you want to use the stuff I'm telling you here, for now, you've got to use the development branch rather than a release branch. Hopefully, that release isn't too far off, but I don't control the button to release it, so I can't kind of promise you anything. And I guess as an example of it basically working, um, it can compile a working version of itself. So Cython doesn't need to be compiled, but we choose to compile it for speed, mainly. Um, and it's, I guess it's fairly basic. And I'm listing the features here just because they kind of tell you what kind of Python code should compile successfully in the uh, Cython limited API. So you've got things like static methods, class methods. You've got one generator expression. You know, so we're not the most modern thing ever. Um, list comprehensions, super you know, classes. It's not particularly strongly typed. Um, and it was, you know, isn't particularly modern. It was targeting Python 2 until kind of last year-ish. Um, and I guess it can also, the other project that's been kind of driving adoption of it and um, sort of nagging me to fix things is this NVIDIA's Rapids AI. Um, so, so Vias there has been, I guess, doing a lot of helpful bug reports and you know, reporting back. And I, I think at least the Scython bit of theirs has basically let them switch to it. So that's kind of the history. Um, why might you want to use it? So I guess in, in this slide, I'm going to talk about SciPy. And I'm just going to put the disclaimer in now. I'm using it as an example because it's an easy example of a module you'll all know. I don't, I have no reason to believe they plan to switch to the limited API. It's, it's just an example. So the, the main reason that, as a user, you care about it is because it reduces the size you have to distribute and the size you have to compile. So they've got 
73 site and extension modules, at least, you know, at the point I wrote this talk. Um, and that, that, that takes up 33 megabytes, and that's per platform, per Python version. And what the limited API lets you do is remove the per Python version. So they could, in principle, compile um, sort of one, one thing for, you know, Python 3.8 upwards, and that, that, I guess, reduces their build time um, and it reduces, reduces a number of other things. Since, I mean, they've noticed this problem. I found that in, in their roadmap. So they complain that the binary sizes built from Scythe and code are large and compile times are long, and this makes them unhappy, and so they want to combine extension modules um, and, you know, limit the use of Scythe, which we, we don't... We don't want them to feel they have to limit the use of Scython. Um, so the, ma the main argument for why you want to do this is that mainly reducing binary size to distribute and time spent building modules and that kind of thing. And that's, that's the benefit that you're getting from the, the limited API. The things I don't buy so much are reduced testing time. So you could say, because it's one extension module that works in all future versions of Python, I'm going to test it once. And I think that would be a mistake. Um, so don't, don't take that away as a message. Um, and then <laughs> future compatibility, um, we'll see. I'll talk a bit more about that later. Um, that's a bit more up in the air, but it helps. Um, so why do Scython developers want to do this? Um, and one of the reasons is obviously that, that users want this. People come to us and ask us to do it, so that's a fairly good reason. Um, one of them is this idea of future compatibility. Um, and so Scython's fairly low down in the dependency chain. So what tends to happen as a new Python release gets prepared, Scython will break because something's got changed, and that's, that's fine. But what that means is that until we fix it, NumPy doesn't work, and SciPy doesn't work, and all these you know, other fairly low-level things that people want to get on and test. Um, and so, so this causes a certain amount of friction because the, I guess the C Python developers do want to remove their private APIs. You know, they want to be able to change things to improve things and make everything work better. Um, and so if, if Scything gets broken, this, they don't enjoy this. Um, but the other side is we actually want to use the, the low-level private APIs for speed. You know, we, we, we kind of want to hack with the internals and try to do things fast. Um, so what we're, what we're viewing limited API as is a kind of compatibility fallback mode. So some people, will, some people will want to use it because it gives them benefits, but it also kind of gives the benefit that Scython has a mode that will keep working into the future even if it stops being maintained, you know, or tricky changes are made, or that kind of thing. So, so that's, that's kind of the way, that, the way that I'm looking at it, that having this fallback mode also reduces, I guess, some of the... The, the friction there. Um, so in terms of what doesn't work, I mean, there's lots of little bits, like generators and coroutines and async stuff is hard. There's this obscure thing with class method that you really don't need to care about. Um, module cleanup is hard. So one, one of the differences um, in normal a API versus limited API is that, that classes are now heap types, and that means they get kind of cleaned up as the module gets destructed. And actually doing that all in the right order turns out to be pretty hard because you can end up with situations where your destructors are calling something that's already been destructed and it, you know, it all ends up a bit crashy. So that, that, that's a potential issue at the end of the program. Um, and the other thing is we're gradually working our way through all the optimizations. So the pure Python stuff works pretty well. But what, what you typically find is that when you start typing things a bit more, so th things like the string ends with function, just as an example, we've got an optimized version of it, and we've only sort of recently looked at it in the, the limited API. So where Scython knows it's a string and knows it's called ends with, it tries to do something clever. And that kind of thing, we're just going through gradually, and, and it may catch you out, and the, the lesson is report a bug when it catches you out. Um, Typed memory views, um, they do work, but they don't before Python 3.11. 3 and, you know, that's just a restriction of what's in the limited API. So some, that, that's the main feature that suddenly starts working. But there's a few of these things where we can, we can only do this from certain points. Um, inheritance from built-in types, there's a way to fix it, but it's quite a big code change. And that's essentially what we're saying is that this... The C code that we generate here on your, on your right, um, we need to know the size of the list object, and that's invisible in the limited API. 
And there are, yeah, there are ways around it, but it's going to be work. They haven't been done yet. So, so that's a fairly big feature that, that won't necessarily work. Um, things like profiling and line tracing, things that kind of interact on the, with the interpreter on a sort of fairly low level, that involves creating code objects and frames. And my view is that this will probably actually never work in the limited API. And actually, that's kind of fine. You know, the people that want to do this aren't distributing something to be built with profiling. They're, they're doing it locally on their computer, and they can, they can, they can use the sort of regular build mode. Um, and then the other thing that doesn't work right now is we've got this um, C import C Python thing, which brings, which gives you access to the the, the Python C API yourself. Um, this this requires some changes. I mean, the code I've shown on here on the the right is how we how we wrap complex, so the the, the complex object, and that gives you fast access to real and imaginary, and. But it gives you fast access in a way that requires the type not to be opaque. So it requires detailed information that isn't exposed in the limited API. Um, that's not necessarily a big restriction. I mean, you, you, clearly, you clearly can't use our wrappers to use bits of the limited API that are that bits that don't feature in the limited API. Um, and so, yeah, this is this is mostly going to be a case that we're just going to have to disable some of this stuff on the on the limited API. Um, but the one thing I want to say here is that these wrappers aren't actually special. We don't use any tricks that you can't do yourself. So if they don't work right now, copy and paste from our files, take the stuff that does work, and it's, it's fine. It's not magic. Um, and I, I guess the, the, the final point here is that we've got some very low-level hacky interaction with the array array module, and that, that, again, people use it, but it's not going to work in the limited API. Sorry, it just isn't. Um, so performance. What, what, what's the performance like? So to measure this, I've used Python um, 3.12. I've built Cython itself with the limited API, and I'm measuring it, and I'm compiling this big expr nodes.py, and that, that files like 15,000 lines or something, so it's ridiculous. So it takes a while to compile. Um, and the first thing to note is that if we look at the size of the compiled Cython, it's actually slightly smaller in the limited API. You know, it's maybe like a quarter smaller or something like that. That wasn't intentional. It was just a kind of interesting observation while I, I did it. Um, and so the bottom line of the table is more interesting. So the time to process this, this Cython file. So in pure Python, it takes about 10 seconds. If you build Cython normally, it takes six seconds. So we get a, a decent speed up. If you build it in the 3.7 limited API, it takes 11.3 seconds. So it's actually a pessimization. You're better off just not compiling Cython. Um, and if you build it in, in the limited API 3.12 version, then it's a bit quicker. So it's 10.4 10 point, 10 point seconds. Um, and the difference there is that it can use vector call, which is a sort of C method of calling Python functions quickly. Um, again, it's fairly transparent to you as a user, but it makes a genuine speed improvement. And then in brackets below, I've got a work in progress fix. So, so the slide's obviously a bit, a bit up in the air. I, I was preparing this slide. I saw that it was a pessimization. And I went and you know, there, were, there was, a, I guess, a mistake, an optimization that we always missed. Um, so in principle, we can just about bring it into being an optimization again. But I guess the lesson here is that if you're using Cython um, just to compile just to compile some, some sort of regular Python code, it may not give you a lot of speed up. So don't, maybe don't do that. On the other hand, um, mem um, things like memory views. So um, memory views are your sort of fast array access. What you find is that there's a bit of the overhead for the function calls. So this graph is array size versus um, time, time per call per array element, and you, you find that they're basically the same for large arrays. So if you're doing things like your main work is calling an external C library, or your main work is working with memory views, the limited API doesn't make that much difference. So use it. You know, it won't, it won't cost you a lot. It will cost you a tiny bit per, per function call. So I guess um, I'm going to sort of skip over this a little bit, but there's, there's various things that um, 
that subtle runtime changes. Um, so this pi type get slot does different things in 3.10 and above versus 3.10 below. So what this means is that, um, I guess, the, the idea that it, you compile once and it works anywhere, I guess, is a bit risky. And a lot of the time, we're replacing um, private C API with private Python API, um, specifically for code objects. So again, you know, it's not necessarily future-proofed into the, into the future. And I guess the key takeaway from this slide is this, this thing on the, this table on the right, this idea that you've got a whole new dimension. So we only test the green line to, down the middle, the idea that you compile it on API 3.10 and run it on API 3.10. But we don't test, compile it on API 3.10, run it on API 3.11. And then you've got a third axis of what you build it on. So there's actually quite a bit of unknowns here that it may not, it may not quite live up to its promise. How do you use it? This is the important bit that I actually want to get through. Um, Siphon to C as normal, so you don't do anything different there. The Siphon doesn't need to be told it's using the limited API, it generates the same code. And then you set a couple of macros. And the two macros you need to set are Siphon limited API, you just need to define that to one to tell it it's using the limited API, and a Pi limited API version. So in this case, the, the interesting versions are 3.7, the kind of minimum, um, 3.11 where memory views get used, introduced, and 3.12, which is vector call, which isn't a new feature, but makes everything faster. And the final thing is you, na you name your compiled file this. Um, so the old setup tools way of doing it, I've just highlighted the difference here. So you're defining the, this may not be the recommended way to build things, but it's kind of the way our documentation uses. I've highlighted the difference. You're defining these, these two macros, and you've got pi limited API equals two, and that's all you need to do, and hopefully it magically works. So the Pi limited API does the renaming of the file. If you want to use scikit build, which is a bit more modern, then the, the work is done in CMake, and I, I get paid to be a C++ developer, and I hate CMake, thank you. Um, and um, so, but here you've got a target compile definitions, um, and um, then you've got the set target properties, and that, the set target properties changes the file name. So again, the box in blue is the only deviation you make from your regular build. And the final example I wanted um, was, was Maison. Um, and again, you've got, you can do, you, here the, you've got the limited API, which, which actually covers both the Pi limited API macro and the renaming the file. And so you only need to just add this extra argument to do this extra definition. So I'm just going to do, I think I've got the time really for one, maybe two of these gory detail slides. So the main, the difference is only at C compile time. So we've got a bunch of these feature macros. So we've got like assume safe macros, assume safe size, and these mean that, you know, we can use these pilot set item macros. And it's really just a bunch of these fairly tedious defines which we, we replace. Um, and the, I guess the other thing, I'll just talk about this before, before I finish, is exceptions and tracebacks. And these are, I guess, pretty fundamental, that we want to show nice tracebacks, but they involve adding f frame objects. Um, and so what we do is this horrendous hack. And, this, and I was quite pleased when I came up with this hack, so I do want to show you it. Um, we call the Python function sysgetFrame. We call code replace to put the right line, um, line numbers and names on. And then we evaluate this code. And that essentially gives us a frame object which we can add to a traceback. So that is, a, I guess, a hacky way of, uh, I'll stop very soon, thank you. Uh, um, that's, a, that's a hacky way of kind of adding the traceback. I'll skip over the rest of the gory details. The slides are online. So the message is, start using it in Scython if it suits you. Use the master branch for now. Report bugs, please. It probably won't be the default. Um, the next step in Scython is to um, start slowly enabling tests, and I guess my view is the limited API should stay limited, mainly so that people aren't tempted to break the promise of the stable API, which is ABI, which is what you want. I'll finish there and try to take questions. So we know. We now have five minutes for questions, um, and you can find microphones in the center of the two hallways in the main hall, if anyone wants to come up and ask something. Hello. Uh, Hi. So, uh, can you scroll to the, uh, maybe the Mason example or uh, some of the others, if, if it's easy for you? The Mason uh, one. Um, 
Yeah, yeah. So uh, uh, it seems that Mason has a support for the limited API because this doesn't have the hexa number and stuff like that. Uh, is there a reason we need a, the, an extra site and limited API defined, or, or could we just look if that limited API hex version is defined, we'll assume this one? Yeah, I, th I think that's the, the, the plan. It's, it was a case of kind of introducing it gradually and trying to test things when it doesn't quite work. But yeah, I, I, I agree, it's, it's pretty unnecessary. Um, Uh, yeah, hi. Really nice work. Uh, I wanted to ask, I saw some projects like HPy, I think. So basically, target broader API for different implementations of Python, like PyPy and maybe some others. Does this bring it any closer, or is it just still strictly C Python thing? It's, it's tangential. So uh, um, PyPy Python actually supports PyPy pretty well, um, as does Graal Python. Um, I had a quick chat with a guy doing a talk about it yesterday. So we, we do support these things because they support the C Python API. Um, I believe some work's been done on HPy, um, like preparatory work, but it's, it's largely only visible to the HPy people. I was kind of hoping to run into some of them here and then to tell me about it, but that hasn't happened yet. Um, <laughs> But yeah, I mean, we have a broad ambition to support HPy, but we've got literally nothing merged. Oh, okay, so this is just tangentially related, not really, not, not exactly the same thing. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it should be, it's, the limited API stuff is, should be more compatible. It should be easier for PyPy and other things to support, but it's not strictly necessary for PyPy support. I see, thanks. Thank you, thank you. I will, I will, I think I have spoken to you, but I'll try to talk about HPy. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for your talk and thank you for your, all your work on the Limited C API. I would like to know if you consider uh, funding to finish the work on the Limited C API because it seems uh, like there are still a few things to do. I mean, the, the things to do are kind of increasingly, increasingly small, you know, it's, it's, the barrier is mainly it's just a lot of small changes that have to be re reviewed. So it's, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't feel to me like there's that much work. It's just slowly getting it all merged, I think, if you, if you see what they Okay, thank you. Do we have any more questions? Okay, I have a question for you, uh, since we still have a little bit more time. Uh, I was wondering about these function decorators I saw in your examples. Uh, these, so where, where should I go? Which? So when you were writing the, oh. the Cython? Yes, yeah, so for example, Cython.binding uh, false. What are these function decorators and why should I use them? Right, so, so Cython now generates this Cy function class, which is a kind of better compiled function. It provides you with extra introspection. So it looks, it looks a lot more like a real Python function. Um, at the time I wrote this, that didn't work. So at this very early commit, you had to turn it off. Um, mostly, now it works, so mostly um, you shouldn't use this decorator. It's, it's, making, it's making your code worse for users. Um, but at the time it was you know, a way to get something small to work. Um, Awesome, thank you. So if there's no more questions, uh, we will be ending here, and we have five minutes to change rooms, and we will be continuing at 11.20 with Victor Steiner's talk about moving the ecosystem to a stable API. Thank you, David. Thank you.